So again, welcome to the final day of the Congress. Uh, we, we, we've talked last night, it's about 1,400 delegates from really all over the world, 74 countries actually. And so the steering committee, you've seen their faces, if there are problems or questions, especially if there are evaluation suggestions for additional changes to the Congress, things you saw that you didn't want to see, things that you would like to see, um, uh, please let us know. You will be sent an email. Uh, in, in the upcoming days for evaluations, and we take those very seriously, so we'd really like you to fill them out and give us your suggestions, what you liked, what you'd like to see different next time. Um, and again, just to remind you that we're planning four years from now to have the World Congress 4.0, and at a location still yet to be defined, uh, the uh, uh, 2019 uh, World Congress will be in a location to be defined. That may be a tour, it may be in one location, but we plan to have some smaller kind of a World Congress light in about two years. And with that, I will turn over the program to Dr. Bible, who will have his systemic therapy for metastatic thyroid cancer uh, panel. Thanks, Greg. It's a delight to be here. And uh, I first have to apologize to not the audience, but to the panelists. Because with the exception of one case that Lori has seen, because it's her case, these are all my cases, and the panel is completely uh, blinded. So we're delighted here to have uh, a, a esteemed panel from across the country and across the world. So uh, Nifa from MD Anderson, uh, farthest away. And then we have Lori Wirth from Boston, the hometown uh, medical oncologist. And then Matt Ringel, who is from a little further away uh, at Ohio State. And then uh, Sophie, who's from a lot further away in France. And then I uh, am from Mayo Clinic. So we have a, a quite broad array. And uh, you will notice that this is one of the few panels that doesn't have a surgeon on it. So, uh, you know, today we're going to talk about mainly non surgical issues. So the, uh, I have no disclosures. Dr. Wirth has some disclosures here because she's presenting a case. And um, the educational objectives that we were assigned are really enumerated here. We want to start to work with you to appreciate the nuances involved in electing systemic therapies versus, versus otherwise, whether to treat, when to treat, and what to treat with. And we'll try and view this broadly construed we want to give you expanded knowledge of the therapeutics available and some of the, the uh, particulars with regard to not only uh, multi-kinase inhibitors but also otherwise. And then we want to give you some sense of the, not only the benefits but the risks of uh, treatments that are available, the collateral damage. So there will be sometimes uh, seemingly an undue emphasis there. So um, to make life difficult for my fellow panelists. We'll start with this case of a classic type uh, papillary thyroid cancer, um, a woman who presented in March of 2000 with a lump in the right neck. Uh, the biopsy showed papillary near total thyroidectomy, uh, got remnant ablation, and then subsequently, two years later, developed neck adenopathy, uh, had a neck dissection, uh, the, all nodes were involved with papillary thyroid cancer, additional radioactive iodine. And now we're two years after that, and we have additional nodes involved. And now we're eight years into the disease in 2008 with surgery number four, more nodes, invasion into muscle, at this time uh, all um, in the neck. But things eventually changed, and I saw the patient when she was referred to me with the question of should we start a, a multi-kinase inhibitor. And here you see a, a difference of about 14 months. The panel on the left is August of 2015 to October of 2016, where you see some disease in the, the um, right chest, which is expanded fairly significantly, and I've listed, uh, you know, thyroglobulin is a problem because we have antibodies in the mass spec, results were not helpful. Um, the TSH is a 0.2, it hadn't changed during that time period, and the radioactive iodine diagnostic imaging was stone-called uh, negative. 
So the question for our panelists, and uh, you know, I'm heckling and we have challenging cases, would be what are next steps? How would you approach this? So maybe NIFA as an endocrinologist, what, what's your take on this case? And you know, are there things we should think about in addition to kinase inhibitor therapy? What, what would you do here? Yeah, so um, I start off by explaining to the patient that they have um, radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer, given that we know that there's disease in the lungs. There's probably some disease still in the neck, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and um, the whole body scan doesn't show any uptake. Um, and that they don't make, um, they have thyroglobin antibodies that interfere with the thyroglobulin, so their marker isn't um, very helpful other than letting us know that there is some disease there. Um, and if we, so, so we always talk about living with disease versus um, trying to cure the disease and some of the differences there. And, and, and how we wait for progression of the disease prior to deciding further therapies because the current therapies are not cures. And then when we do cross-sectional imaging, we would have done cross-sectional imaging of the neck and the chest. Um, uh, potentially some would have done a PET. Um, I tend to do cross-sectional imaging just because I get thinner cut CTs and I know this is a patient that I need to follow, for example, from August to um, October. So over a 13, 14 month period, um, I explained to the patient that they've had some progression, um, so it, we probably do need to do something about it. Is that the only area of growth? No, this is just an example. Okay. So, because um, sometimes if that's the only area of growth, we can talk about a localized therapy to that area, but otherwise um, we start talking about um, uh, systemic therapy as well as um, doing molecu molecular testing on their tumor. So Matt wants to provide input. Yeah, the only other thing in addition to the cross-sectional imaging mentioned is that at least at, at our place, we would also do a brain MRI at this point. Uh, before considering, because that will not be detected properly on a on a PET CT or on a chest neck CT, yeah, so uh, and that's a hidden area that you're going to want to know about before making a decision. And we've we talk about this a lot amongst us. You know, we forget that maybe, at least in my weird practice, up to 20 percent of patients with very extensive disease will have brain metastasis. So the MRI um, head was negative at this point, and. Um, Comments, Sophie, from your standpoint, is there anything you would do before, consider before moving on to kinase inhibitors, and then you'll you'll see kind of the devious approach that well, I took here. Re re regarding the the workup, um, either I would do FDG PET or uh, um, spine MRI. Yeah. There's not only the brain metastasis, but also the bone metastasis. Mm -hmm. We have to yeah, be to helpful. be aware. The, um, you didn't tell us how old this lady is. Yes. So this patient's in her 50s, and she's asymptomatic. So the asymptomatic part is important. Lori, comments? Uh, sure, I think, uh, you know, I'm thinking about two things. Um, one is um, you've got plenty of tissue from her previous surgeries. Um, so uh, until recently, I wouldn't necessarily have jumped to genotyping the tumor, but now that we have multiple uh, genotype-driven clinical trial options for patients to be thinking about down the pike, um, that's something that I am really starting to do earlier uh, in the course of treatment. I don't give them a first-line TKI, wait for them to progress, and then genotype at this point. Um, and I think that the in general, there's fairly good correlation um, uh, uh, between um, uh, primary tumor, lymph node, genotype, and, and distant metastatic disease, but there isn't 100% correlation, of course. Um, she does have recurrent disease in the neck that's really readily accessible, so I'd be tempted to get a fresh bi biopsy for genotyping uh, of that. Um, and then. Okay, how's this? Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, so what I was saying is that I would definitely want to do genotyping earlier rather than waiting until uh, uh, progressing on a first-line uh, TKI therapy. 
Um, I would think about a fresh biopsy of the neck because there is easily accessible biopsyable disease and without having to subject the patient to an endoscopic procedure uh, or trans uh, thoracic uh, uh, needle biopsy. Um, and then uh, the um, I think uh, four or five years ago I might have thought about waiting a little while longer before starting a TKI because of the balance of, of quality of life and side effects with benefit from the TKIs. Um, but I, I have, I think, uh, begun to feel that there are a lot of data um, that suggests that earlier is better with uh, initiating a TKI like lenvatinib. Um, there are analyses of the select uh, uh, data that show that um, you get a better uh, PFS benefit uh, starting therapy at a lower tumor volume, um, and that suggests that earlier is better. And then also, if you look at the crossover, so it, in the lenvatinib trial, patients were randomized to lenvatinib versus placebo, and those that were, uh, and then at the time of progression, they were unblinded. Those that were on the placebo arm then were offered crossover, and a very large percentage of patients who did progress on placebo did cross over and receive uh, uh, the lenvatinib study drug. That median time to crossover or progression was at four months. Um, and we saw um, that the response rate and the PFS benefit in the crossover arm and otherwise randomized patient population was not quite as good as the patients who were randomized to lenvatinib from the get-go. And so, in theory, starting a, a lenvatinib only at a median of four months later. So I think that there are multiple lines of data that suggest that we don't want to wait too long before starting therapy. So I'd be thinking about starting lenvatinib in this patient. So, so Sophie, do you uh, in France do genotyping on all of these patients at this stage, or do you wait? We, no, I, I would genotype it now. So I, I think we have consensus yeah. here, and this is something to maybe propagate to our individual practices is to think earlier about interrogation, at least for more readily targetable mutations. Particularly in a classic papillar, we wonder about BRAF at a minimum, um, and that may be something that's more readily available than a more global genotyping. Sophie has a comment here. Yeah, I, I would definitely, um, there's another argument to, to start, uh, not without waiting too long, because the lung lesion is quite co close to the heart, and in K, sorry, Better like this then. <laughs> There's another argument to start uh, TKI not without waiting too long because the lung lesion is quite close to the heart and in case uh, the lady doesn't respond to the first line therapy, uh, we might have trouble if you wait longer. Perfect. So I think these points are all wonderful and well taken. But, you know, I've learned to, I've been trained, I'm a medical oncologist, but I've been trained by my colleagues in endocrinology to dot the I's and cross the T's. So what we tend to do is we don't trust outside our REI imaging, so we'll often um, do, you know, the low iodine diet will be very conscientious and assess that was done in this case. But um, something that really was not completely attended to was this question of TSH suppression. And I, I've been sometimes surprised, as in this case, and this is where the panelists uh, start throwing uh, rotten tomatoes at me, because I figured we had a little bit of time to see what would happen if we more fully suppressed TSH. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. So here the TSH is pretty well suppressed, but not to the point one level. So the first thing we did was to to just increase slightly levothyroxine, and we were all stunned to see this dramatic response. And we're expecting that this will not be durable because you know we know we're going to need something else. But this, you know, any little bit that can buy a little time is helpful. So this was kind of a useful starting point. And I think the question that comes up is, uh, you know, Bible, we can find one case of anything. But I have a number of patients where there has been similar. Um, relatively modest change in the level of TSH suppression with levothyroxine that's led to disease progression and then re regression again. And here's a, a different uh, example of that in another uh, papillary patient. Um, so the, um, we're expecting that lenvatinib and kinase inhibitors are in the cards for this patient. 
but we're delighted to at least provide a little, um, a little break before we go there and add additional, additional side effects. So this is kind of the, the basics. Just attend to the, you know, the thyroid cancer 101. I still think that's highly unusual. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm not. To, so this is a question. Just so to be Nifa, controversial. Have you? Um, so I guess there are a couple questions. One is, if you don't uh, intervene like this, you won't see it. And so we have to ask that question. So have, uh, who on the panel has seen something of similar magnitude to this? Is this, so Matt is saying yes. Yeah, not, not super common, but, but certainly before, at least in my practice, before we would refer that patient to medical oncology or, or do the genomic testing, we would want to make sure that the TSH was fully suppressed. Um, as long as the patient can tolerate or do you add in a beta blocker or whatever you need to do uh, before they would, would get to you. So Sophie is already mad at me and smiling. No, so do you, have you seen this kind of response on occasion? Just w once Just in once. 15 okay. years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I would say I've, I've, I think I've seen one case as well. What, what is certainly more frequent and not applicable in this patient with antibodies is you can certainly see the thyroglobulin go up with less yeah. suppression and go down with better suppression. So this is um, a large portion of my practice is trying to figure out how to delay the initiation of MKI therapy. So this is in that, uh, that spirit. So we'll go on to case two, and I think that the panel will continue to be irritated with me. I'm always irritated with you, Keith. It's fine. So, you know, Matt, you know. This is standard. This is standard. It's like so we're it's brothers. Okay. We yeah, love you, Keith. Yeah. So this case is also going to be, uh, have some nooks and crannies to it. And um, some of this we won't really um, put the panel on the spot, but some, some we will. So this was a 33-year-old woman, so a younger woman by a couple decades, who in 2010 self-detected a, a lump. So this wasn't incidentally detected. <clears throat> and it was deemed suspicious on FNA, had a total thyroidectomy, had 23 nodes involved, but this was called uh, grade one back in 2010. And um, so before we look at the, the REI scan and other data, um, comments, um, NIFA, on prognosis expectations for this patient? Um, so, you know, I always talk with the patient about there's certain factors that make you at lower risk for recurrence or problem, problems with disease and certain factors that make you at higher risk. And so, you know, being um, a young female that is on her side in general, um, there are young people who do uh, poorly from uh, an oncologic standpoint. But, um, and her total thyroidectomy, we don't have her full path to comment on her being high risk or not, and I'm sure Dr. Bible's doing that to me on purpose, but I would need, you know, the size of the tumor, extrathyroidal extension, um, lymphovascular invasion, uh, and all that information would be important, plus where these nodes are located. Um, you said 23 nodes had cancer in them, but um, I need to know more information about the size of the nodes um, and what, where they were. I'm assuming there were some lateral nodes and if there was extra nodal extension, and all that information would be important. And um, I'm, it, I'm assuming this was classic variant of papillary yep. thyroid carcinoma, so but all that information would yeah. be important. I can help with that. So no extra nodal extension. The largest node was right at about a centimeter. I think there were 30 nodes total examined, so the vast majority were involved. There was no macroscopic disease deemed left at the time of the initial surgery. Uh, no family history. Um, so that kind of gives you a little background. No radiation exposure, no, uh, no known um, lymphocytic thyroiditis. Okay. And the size of the tumor in classic variant? The size of the tumor, as I recall, was slightly over two centimeters. Okay. So, um, and there were lat these were lateral nodes? Yes. Because you there said there were 30 removed. Nodes. Yeah. So um, you have the largest, you have multiple lymph nodes that are involved. Um, you had 30 lymph nodes um, removed, 23 of them had cancer in them, but the largest was one centimeter. So if you look at the ATA guidelines, this puts her at an intermediate risk of recurrence, um, and she is somebody what we would consider for um, radioactive iodine. So this was a patient seen elsewhere, and um, what happened next was a diagnostic scan, and here are some screen captures from that. 
So maybe I'll stay with NIFA for a moment. So what are your comments on these REI diagnostic images? What do you think, NIFA? So um, I would want to look at this with spec, but I think it's quite obvious on this scan that you have, and I need anterior posterior, but it looks like this is bilateral lung uptake. Um, you have a very high thyroglobulin. You have a diagnostic whole body scan that shows um, lung uptake. So you're having the discussion um, with her that she has metastatic thyroid cancer in her lungs um, and that she will definitely need treatment with radioactive iodine. And so she had axial imaging, as we're all apt to want to do in this case. And uh, I, I had to kind of give you an expansion view to kind of give you a sense when I reviewed this later. This all happened elsewhere, and more is going to happen elsewhere that you'll gasp about. Um, so I'm going to warn you about that, so just be prepared. <laughs> so um, with these micro metastases to the lung, and maybe I'll go to um, Matt next. So um, what are your thoughts? Is this someone you treat with radioactive iodine? How would you approach it? Yeah, this is certainly someone in my practice that would get radioiodine therapy, but you have to actually be very careful with the radioiodine therapy in a patient like this. And I'm sure there's some nuclear medicine folks in the room. I, I see Len Wartowski back there. He'll throw something at me. If I don't say uh, that we would certainly want to do dosimetry in a case like this, uh, in this situation, uh, you're really looking not to overtreat the patient. There's considerable risk, I think, if you overtreat this patient of of uh, leading toward pulmonary fibrosis and having too much uptake in those lungs. When you have a diagnostic scan that looks more like a VQ perfusion scan, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be, be a, little bit, a little bit concerned about, about toxicity from radioactive iodine that could then be, you know, become rate limiting. So we would typically take a patient like this, make sure they didn't get IV contrast on the CT, uh, all that, make sure preparation is all correct, uh, and we would do whole body dosimetry in this patient to make sure that we're not exceeding a, you know, a safe level of, radi of radiation exposure to the lungs and bone marrow. So Matt, one question before I ask Sophie what happens with dosimetry in France, but Matt, how long do we normally have to wait after contrast load? to do imaging, what's your... Yeah, so can you guys hear Keith? Because I don't think he's into the mic. Okay, so what he's asking is, is, is how long to wait if the patient had IV contrast from this CT. Um, and um, the, the time actually is usually pretty quick in a patient who's got normal renal function. Uh, we would measure urine iodine um, and see where they are on a normal diet, uh, typically, to decide the timing. Um, you're probably safe if you wait at least three months, but oftentimes patients will clear it much more quickly than that. So we would typically uh, get a spot urine iodine, or you could do a 24-hour um, on a regular diet, make sure that that's in the normal range and not, you know, in the thousands, uh, and then go ahead and proceed at that point. But we would do that first. Okay. Thanks, Matt. So can you hear me better now? Thanks. Of course, if you couldn't hear me, you wouldn't respond, so it doesn't help too much. <laughs> so, Sophie, what's the practice in France? Do you do, uh, do you do dosimetry? Do you not, would you not do dosimetry here? What would be your approach? Actually, we do not do dosimetry. Uh, we give fixed dose of uh, radioactive iodine with an activity of 100 millicuries of 3.7 gigabit uh, we, we give it for every six months for two years. Uh, being sure that we do have a uh, response on the TG level and on the scintigraphic level, but also on the CT scan. Uh, with this protocol, we have not seen a pulmonary fibrosis, and the chance of this lady to be cured is about uh, 95%. Mm -hmm. So this patient was treated elsewhere, but look at the, what do you think about this dose of radioactive iodine, Sophie? Are you, wor are you worried about this? Are you comfortable with this dose? You said maybe 100 millicuries yes, would be practice? Yes, we, we give 100. Well, 250, um, um, I'm sure that uh, she's going to have more secondary effects on the salivary glands. That's uh, for sure. Whether she's going to have a better tumor response, uh, we do not think so based on the retrospective study we, we performed uh, comparing fixed dose to um, doses given after the symmetry. 
So, um, NIFA at Anderson, would you do dosimetry here? Would you not do dosimetry? Would you take the approach that Sophie outlined with a fixed smaller dose? What, what would you have done? Yeah, so um, we don't do um, dosimetry routinely, um, but we would have erred on the lower side, but probably 150 millicuries, um, unless something uh, suggested otherwise. Um, but we definitely would not have given 250 millicuries. And we also um, don't repeat the radioactive iodine every six months, um, so our practice is slightly different. Um, we would have given the one dose and then waited to see the response and um, wait for uh, thyroglobulin to rise or um, seeing growth on cross-sectional imaging. So um, we've kind of covered these questions. So what happened symptomatically is the patient became dysmic relatively within months, relatively mm -hmm. soon after uh, receiving the radioactive iodine. She was hospitalized, and then this was her CT scan, and um, basically she was disabled and required oxygen therapy from the extent of um, her desaturation um, with any, even at rest, she was, uh, she was below 80% saturation. And so um, this is where the gas may come out. So locally, she was believed uh, to have rapidly progressive metastatic papillary thyroid cancer. Um, so what do we think? Lori, do you think that's uh, credible? Are you, is your jaw drop, dropping? What, what's your thought about the plausibility or likelihood of that as a, as a you know, a conclusion here. Is that accurate? Is that crazy? What, what would you say? Well, so, you know, I have to say I don't have experience in uh, acute, seeing acute lung injury following radioiodine in patients like this, um, but I certainly would wonder if that's a possibility here, um, uh, given the time course. And then the CT scan as well, um, this is, does not look like progressive uh, papillary thyroid cancer for sure, um, that uh, more uh, inflammatory appearance rather than a nodular appearance um, of the small lesions growing um, is uh, not at all consistent with progressive iodine refractory DTC. Um, so I would be uh, uh, calling the pulmonologist and trying to figure out the best way to get a tissue diagnosis. So and also, uh, I'm sure that we would be starting steroids. So Matt, you had mentioned pulmonary fibrosis. Maybe you've seen this before. What, what are your thoughts? Do we need a tissue diagnosis here? Are you? Well, I've not seen it often. Um, I've only seen it one or two cases. I don't know that I've seen it so acutely, actually. I think I've seen it more chronically in yeah. patients that have gotten multiple uh, dosing. Um, so I would get pulmonary involved, but I think I agree. I mean, I think that would certainly be the presumptive diagnosis. Um, but not necessarily the absolute diagnosis without at least getting their involvement in agreement. So at this time, there actually was a lung biopsy that was done elsewhere. And it was interpreted as containing metastatic papillary thyroid cancer. But it, yeah. this was the report. <laughs> yeah. This was the report, but uh, NIFA and everybody on the panel. What are you guys doing in there? I know it's not you, but what, 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 what about, what's going on in the community up in Minnesota? Yes, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's close, but not close enough to Canada, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, it must have been Wisconsin. So, Wisconsin. Sophie. Did you have data on the TG level? Yeah, so the TG level went down to uh, in, in the neighborhood of 20. So it was from you know, several hundreds to very low. So this is a very good question because, you know, when I ended up seeing this, I was thinking, you know, this, this was uh, adding to my concern that this was a, a lung reaction from the radioactive iodine, especially with a micrometastasis. The patient was unfortunately started on serafinib by her home endocrinologist. Um, but when we looked at the specimen, if you look closely, what you'd see is tiny little clusters of cells that were papillary surrounded by massive halos of fibrotic lung tissue. But the pathology re report did not reflect this at all. You had to, to look at it. And I'm sorry I don't have that slide. And so uh, what um, I did here, and the panel is already getting gun shy with regard to my uh, evil ways, what we did was to stop the uh, serafinib and start prednisone. And the patient responded fairly well, but 
was still oxygen dependent for a number of years, but is now, you know, um, less tethered to oxygen, but it's taken quite some time to uh, see this improvement. So I have a question for Lori now. So Lori, do you think that the, um, you, we've talked about how this uh, pulmonary fibrosis is less, is not, is kind of rare with radioactive iodine. Do you think that the addition of the serafinib may have been a aggravating factor here, given the, what, what are your comments about that with this, uh, you know, radiation recall and, you know, can we aggravate to the effects of radiation? Have you, what do you think, is it a plausible um, confounding factor, or irrelevant? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the questions that I had was if this serafinib had been started before that blossoming lung process it was seen. So it, it was started after yes. that she became shorter. But yeah, that's what I thought. So I could, um, uh, could serafinib have exacerbated that phenomenon? Um, I, I think it could. We just don't have a lot of experience in giving the, the VEGFR multiconase inhibitors concurrently with radiation. Um, there have been, um, certainly as far as I know, not a standard uh, of care in any solid tumor. Um, there have been clinical trials that have added carefully and cautiously uh, uh, MKIs, including the uh, uh, pazopinib trial with anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, and so, you know, it, it, I, it, it certainly seems like uh, there isn't a huge safety signal. Um, but can it happen on a on a case by case basis? I would think yes, that's certainly a possibility. The other thing in, in, that you'd want to think about in terms of of uh, exacerbation is if there's a hemorrhagic component to the process as well um, on a VEGFR TKI. And Nifa comments to embellish. She, to tell us a little bit about this these reports of uh, radiation recall from kinase inhibitors. Do you see this very often? Is this a, a concern of yours? So um, typically, the, when when we're seeing radiation um, induced uh, a, a radiation recall, it was in the patient who received radiation to the head and neck for their thyroid cancer um, a while ago, and then we're now giving them an anti-VEGF or a kinase inhibitor um, for their systemic disease, and you get this big, bright red skin um, and burns or sometimes patients who have had spinal radiation. And unfortunately, it's not that it's that common, but we always question when a patient has had a history of radiation, can we reintroduce that, both with BRAF inhibitors as well as um, anti-VEGF kinase inhibitors. So it is something to be careful about. But I, like Lori, have not seen that in the lungs. Um, and like Matt, typically I'll see the radiation pneumonitis uh, after, uh, or the lung injury after radioactive iodine a while later, especially when somebody's been given a second dose, like the patients come in dyspneic on oxygen uh, and blue. And so you definitely want to be careful. And I was going to ask you, I'm assuming Mayo Clinic had not read that pathology. Um, but yes, there is metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma inside. So you do always want to re-review everything and trust the people that, you know, you work with. All, all critical. So these first two cases, you know, are really aberrant. but. Um, they at least allow us to talk about these issues of when to treat, can we do, uh, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's with the radioiodine uh, treatment and, you know, if appropriate, and also the TSH suppression. Um, they get at the potential collateral damage, the need to confirm pathology and what's going on before you treat. So they're more related, these two cases are more related to when to treat, when not to treat, and uh, that's a lead-in for the other cases, which will be less, I think, annoying to the panel. <laughs> and Lori, I think um, we're gonna come up to your case in just a moment, but the point here is that if you take all the, the thyroid cancer um, patients, only about three and a half percent, at least if you look at, uh, at American Cancer Society data in the U.S. will succumb to their disease, so there's very great risk of overtreatment. So we have to be very cautious and uh, realize that there's because of the the minority of patients who will die from this disease. We have to be uh, very uh, conscientious about uh, making sure that we know what we're treating 
when we move forward. And Keith, like you said, um, always look at your own cross-sectional imaging. That cannot be um, overstated uh, because if you have a patient with metastatic thyroid cancer and you have a component that looks inflammatory, I mean, this case was acute lung injury, but it very um, commonly can also happen that a patient can have a second malignancy. So if you have some component of inflammation or some ground glass, that's typically not thyroid, differentiated thyroid cancer, and you want to think about biopsy. So uh, this is really good to bring out uh, NIFA because uh, I've had some patients who had a disproportionately growing lesion that turned out to be non-small cell lung mm -hmm. that was coexistent. I've had a couple patients develop BOOP uh, mm -hmm. coexistent with their thyroid cancers. Uh, sarcoid is really very common, especially with nodal disease. So, you know, being very conscientious, knowing what you're treating is, is important, and we've seen occasional anaplastic transformation too. Mm -hmm. Sophie, any final comments about these two cases before we move on to a case from Lori? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I totally agree that we should um, be careful not to overtreat patients. Uh, but again, some of them, especially those with metastatic disease, should not be under-treated, especially those that are refractory. This is so, the balance. So it's always the, difficult, the, the most difficult part is when to start. So, Lori, I've slightly corrupted your case to increase the size of the images and fonts to help a little bit, but mostly your slides are intact. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about this case and walk us through? Uh, sure. So this is a patient of mine who is I'm currently taking care of. He's now a fit 78-year-old man. Um, he first had thyroidectomy uh, in 1981. Uh, uh, and had at that time his pathology described as a mixed papillary and follicular thyroid cancer. It was seven centimeters in size. I don't have a lot of details of, uh, as I don't have the original path report. There was no extrathyroidal extension. Um, he had 30 millicuries of radioiodine at that point um, 30 years ago, and we don't know uh, if, what a post-treatment uh, scan showed. Um, in 2000, so 20 years later, uh, he had a recurrence in the neck with a left neck dissection with three of 24 nodes that showed papillary thyroid carcinoma. Um, so you would think he has an excellent prognosis at that point, I, w I, w I would imagine. Um, with, uh, and then he had radioactive iodine, 150 millicuries, and the post-treatment scan at that point was negative. A year later, uh, he had lung nodules that were, that were found on, act, and he was continued to be followed with active surveillance and TSH suppression from then onward. Um, fast forward another decade later, he had, um, which is about the time I think that I met him, um, he was referred to me uh, by his thyroid endocrinologist, um, thinking that at some point this gentleman is going to need TKI therapy, so they might as well meet Lori and, and become friends. Um, he had stable lung nodules that were all sub-centimeter, two to six millimeters at the time, and his suppressed thyroid globulin level was 2.4. So. Um, I've seen him since and scanned him, um, I'm sorry, I don't recall the interval, probably every six months initially, and then we, then we moved to annual imaging and thyroid globulin follow-up, and he continues to follow up with his endocrinologist as well. Um, in 2013, he had an increase in lung nodules um, up to one centimeter, um, and his suppressed thyroid globulin then was 5.8. Uh, we do uh, immunohistochemistry on pathology, and, um, and as well as uh, at that time, we're screening patients for a clinical trial that with a MEK inhibitor, and he was found then, I think, by the uh, PCR to be uh, BRAF wild type. Um, again, uh, we followed him, and he remained asymptomatic and had slowly progressive disease uh, in the lung nodules, and his thyroid globulin uh, uh, continued to rise very slowly. Then in January of 2017, he showed up in the emergency room throwing up and a little bit unsteady on his feet, a little bit dehydrated. Um, they thought he had gastroenteritis and sent him home, um, but um, he returned to the emergency room a few days later feeling even worse. He had headaches, um, gait unsteadiness, and so further workup was done at that time. <laughs> 
Uh, I have a, actually, uh, I have a question. Can you raise, I'd like to see a raise of hands. How many patients, I mean, how many people would um, see this guy in the emergency room uh, the first go around and think he needs brain imaging? Yeah, I mean, you know we're presenting the case for a reason, right? So. Can I comment on a few things? Just so, I know people are voting, but um, you looking... Vote. Well, I guess you didn't raise your hand. You wouldn't have done the imaging. No. So, and that's what I wanted to comment on. I mean, just thinking about common things being common. Even back in 2000 and... I can't read. Is it 2001? So, you know when he had... Um, he had lung, small lung nodules, sub-centimeter lung, lung nodules, and had some lymph nodes in his neck. At that time, I still, we didn't know whether the lung nodules were, were metastatic thyroid cancer or granulomas, right? Because he hadn't had chest imaging before. So you don't want to jump in there and say, I mean, just like um, Lori's partner who was following him wouldn't necessarily have assumed that that was metastatic thyroid cancer. Um, so that would not have been the time to do treatment. And you follow them, but then you know that they're thyroid cancer once they start increasing. He doesn't make much thyroglobulin for the volume of disease that he has, and so that's not a very helpful marker. So your cross-sectional imaging was key there, but tiny lung nodules, subsonometer that went to a sonometer, and then you come in with vomiting, I don't think that necessarily says that that's brain meds yeah. to me. What was the thyroglobulin between 2013 and 2017? I don't remember. I had to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's on the next slide. Uh, so when he returned to the emergency room uh, with uh, progressive symptoms, he did have brain imaging, which certainly was appropriate at that time. And he was found to have a solitary 2.3 centimeter hemorrhagic enhancing intraventricular mass in the right lateral vent. Oh, there you go. Thyroglobulin yeah. was 40. So that, so that, so would, so that would have gotten the brain, had, and that yeah. would have gotten the brain and, MRI before. For uh, probably yeah, so the time. so and now I'm recalling the the details. So he actually so his thyroid globulin had remained um, increasing very uh, very little bit, and then uh, yeah, it had yeah. jumped. But he was also on annual surveillance at the time too. So so did it begin to rise? If I w you know would we have detected a rise earlier at at six months? Probably, but we don't know for sure. Um, so the patient was admitted to the neurosurgery service. The next day, they did a right craniotomy, um, and um, and lo and behold, they did find a papillary thyroid carcinoma metastasis. Um, he then was treated postoperatively uh, with um, uh, uh, radiation therapy t with 30 gray, receiving a total of 30 gray in 10 fractions. It was not a whole brain radiation; it was a focal. Uh, uh, radiation therapy so, that he received. Lori, I, I have a question. See, we'll we'll have you chair for a moment, and then we'll we'll have. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'll take that. But um, he did receive whole brain radiation because of the intraventricular um, uh, nature of the disease. So I wasn't sure if that was something that you had um, modified in the slide. Or so I'm been. curious from other panel members, given the very long, otherwise indolent history of this disease. Um, would NIFA, um, would you have treated with uh, radiotherapy or just observed for a while given the potential um, collateral damage from whole brain? So NIFA, do you want to start? And Sophie, I think, is looking at me like she has a comment. Um, yeah, so I would have, yes, followed with radiation post-craniotomy. The brain is, I take the brain very seriously. Um, so, uh, you know, a recurrence in that area post-op would have been uh, very bad. Plus, there was intraventricular hemorrhage, and I um, definitely would have followed with radiation post-op. So, Matt, would you have also radiated? Uh, typically, yes, uh, we, we would follow with, uh, with radiation. You know, obviously, neuro-oncology and all would be involved in this as well. And Sophie? Also? Yes, also. We would uh, definitely do local radiation and not at all the whole brain radiation. Excellent. So th thanks for letting me interrupt, Lori. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, and, and I think also at our center in general, we have neuroradiation oncologists who uh, uh, typically weigh in in these patients, and we're, we're certainly doing more focal SBRT uh, to follow after surgery or, or um, uh, if patients don't have the craniotomy um, rather than whole brain radiation as, uh, in general. But because of the intraventricular disease, they felt that whole brain radiation was more appropriate. 
um, because of the CSF component. And also we can't underscore the discussion with the neurosurgeon. So the one who operated on to help us decide next steps and risk versus benefit while we discuss with them, yes, we're going to need, which is what Keith was going to, we're going to eventually need systemic therapy, and so the risk versus benefit. Would, so would, the would someone consider radiation only, stereotactic radiation rather than surgery followed by radiation? So it, I think the driver here was the intraventricular hemorrhage that probably, but in general I agree, we have a lot of patients with, with brain metastases that we treat now with stereotactic radiotherapy without surgery, very commonly. And the, the other question maybe was there some obstruction to the lateral ventricular wing that was causing some flow issues, so that was probably the other, but we would normally not operate on these patients, Sophie, if it weren't for those specific issues. Right, and then, yeah, so he, you know, he did have uh, uh, symptoms consistent with uh, an obstructive process. Um, and then also, I think the surgeons will, will take into account the resectability of the lesion and, and then the neurologic hit that they may or may not have from resection as well. Um, so with brain treatment, I think it's definitely not one size fits all and, and really, you know, our, our expert uh, surgeons and radiation oncologists are very helpful in, in making those decisions. Yeah, I, I agree with Lori. I mean, I think that this is not necessarily goes straight to stereotactic ra brain radiation. Obviously, as everybody said, it's a multidisciplinary approach with neurosurgery and, and radiation. But at the same time, we do have retrospective data that suggests that resection of a brain met, especially a single brain met, um, can improve outcomes. We, um, we need to do those studies in, with SBRT. I know a lot of us are doing that because it's easy. It's a one zap but I do think that we need to look at outcomes data, plus this patient had symptoms, so I think it makes a difference in surgical um, removal. So, so uh, Mr. Uh, WP recovered very well. Um, neurologically, he was, uh, had a stay in rehab and then was discharged home. He was ambulating. He did have minimal left residual left lower extremity weakness when I saw him after discharge. Um, he then uh, continued to follow up closely, and in June we did a PET CT that showed a slight increase in lung nodules and new progressive disease in the liver with new liver and bone lesions without a CT correlate. His brain MRI postoperatively uh, uh, looked great, and his thyroid globulin then was 37. So one thing I, I, that we would certainly would have done, you, may, you probably did it as well, but maybe you're going to come to it, would be to uh, do some genomic analysis of the brain metastasis that was removed. Uh, we're very aggressive at our place about getting, you know, biopsy tissue of growing or symptomatic mets. They're going to be the very likely genomically similar to what you're going to be choosing to treat as we go forward. Um, and you probably did that. We would do a more general screen, not a thyroid-specific screen typically, but a, a more general screen, uh, like a foundation medicine or, or if you have something in diet on that. And we would, we would do that routinely on this. You're speaking my language. <laughs> no, we didn't see the cases before, so. <laughs> so, uh, so what's the best therapy? Um, so, so I agree that, that at this point, uh, uh, doing genomic analysis would be, would be very interesting. Um, and then I, I think that, that, um, th that this is a case where this is a no-brainer. This patient needs systemic therapy. So it's, no it's, it's <laughs> uh, the question is, is what is the best therapy? Um, and one of the uh, things I think uh, that uh, gave me a little bit of pause was, um, you know, my go-to drug um, would be lenvatinib in general for first-line uh, iodine refractory progressive DTC, but in a patient with a hemorrhagic uh, brain lesion, um, I, even though his, his MRI is clean at this point, um, um, I, I would consider that um, a relative contraindication, and I'd be very happy if I could find an alternative good therapy for him. Um, and so uh, uh, this uh, just represents the, the uh, two FDA-approved drugs that we have, serafinib and lenvatinib. Um, both, as you know, were studied in placebo-controlled randomized trials. Um, and um, uh, this shows the results from serafinib with a PFS uh, improvement uh, with median PFS of 10.8 months and overall response rate of 12 percent. 
Um, and then we have the select data that showed a median PFS of 18.3 months um, and an overall response rate of 65%. So um, my point with this slide is, is, as I said, I consider lenvatinib the drug of choice for first-line therapy um, because one of the lessons of life is that you don't always get second chances, uh, and that's certainly true in oncology. And there aren't circumstances where um, we would use a drug that um, has a less PFS benefit and, and less overall response rate when there's a drug that has um, better data. So Lori might interrupt for a second. So Sophie, what do you think about the um, hemorrhagic brain metastasis? Is that an absolute contraindication for a VEGFR-directed kinase inhibitor? Is it relative? How long do you have to wait after radiation? What are, what are your insights there? Well, um, once the lesion has been resected and extended radiation performed, I think that she clearly ha can have uh, anti-VGF treatment. Okay, and... I, I would go for it if there's an indication because of uh, other lesions. And, and Naifa, do you agree or disagree? Would you be reluctant? Would you search for another treatment as Lori has, has proposed and, you know, seems like if there's a rationale? Um, so, I mean, I would have a discussion with this patient that there are serious risks, but obviously um, they do need systemic therapy. And I agree with um, Matt in terms of um, uh, doing molecular profiling on the tumor, because if this patient did have um, a BRAF, then with less anti-VEGF um, activity, then that would be a, a good choice and actually can cross the blood-brain barrier has been shown in melanoma. Um, and we've had thyroid cancer patients' brain mets shrink with that, so that would have been a nice choice if they had it. If they didn't, we can look at the rest of the profile and see if there's any clinical trials that are also available that they also would qualify having a history of brain metastases that are treated. Um, but short of that, I think if we didn't have anything on the molecular profiling and, um, uh, you know, to be able to point us to, like we often do with Herthel cells, then that would be, um, this would be the choice. Um, if I were very worried, and I would, of course I would have a discussion with neurosurgery about the risk of bleeding and the area where the uh, brain met is and what the risks are, because another choice that we could do is um, off-label everolimus with less anti-VEGF activity. We don't have information with brain mets, but we do have information in DTC. So Laurie, what happened? What, how did you approach this? I'm going to fast forward over the side effect profile because we talked about that. Well, we did genotyping, of course. Um, so in, in our institution, we have in-house assays that uh, look um, at a panel of uh, multiple loci and 91 genes that are frequently mutated in cancer, which is called Snapshot. And we also have the Archer platform for looking at fusions. And the Archer platform is nice because it's, a, it's an anchored multiplex PCR assay for fusion transcript detection. And basically, it's agnostic to the fusion partner, so you can find uh, uh, even novel fusions with RET, for example, um, or you can find all of the various RET uh, 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 rearrangements that have been characterized in thyroid cancer, not just the most common ones. Um, so this patient on snapshot did have a TERT promoter mutation and an NTREC3 mutation, uh, uh, fusion with EML four, which have been described um, more, a little bit more commonly in, in lung cancer, but has also been described in thyroid cancer. So Matt, what do you think about this particular combination, and do you think that NTRAC is, you know, likely to be a driver here or not likely to be a driver? What are your comments about these particular mutation results? Well, I'd, I'd like to know uh, actually a little bit more in terms of other mutations or, v or variants of unknown significance, but assuming that this was all that was really found, and the, H I'm sorry, the TERP promoter is not entirely surprising. That's a, as I think most in the room know, we've talked about that a lot at this meeting as a common, um, as a common mutation, uh, typically second, um, second, uh, secondary mutation that occurs in, in progressive metastatic thyroid cancer. Uh, the TREC3 is, is, a, is a low frequency fusion uh, uh, a, a, uh, in, uh, in thyroid cancer. Uh, as we were discussing at some point at the meeting, it's about 2% uh, or so uh, incidence. Um, it is uh, felt to be a driver and has been shown to be a driver. Um, 
Uh, I don't know particularly that it's associated with aggressive disease per se, but uh, there are clinical trials directed toward, uh, toward this target um, that are ongoing right now, so uh, it is a potentially actionable um, uh, rearrangement or fusion. So what happened here, Laurie? What, well, what did you do? Uh, so, uh, well, so one, you know, one comment about uh, the the uh, you know the the frequency of the NTREC fusions, um, and then whether they're related with more aggressive cancers. I think we don't know the answer to know. that question yeah, yet. Um, and you know, when you see a case like this, you think, oh, maybe it really is. Um, but <clears throat> but we don't know. Um, uh, I do have patients in whom we've identified NTREC fusions um, who have had. Um, recurrent, advanced, progressive disease, which is why I'm seeing them to begin with, however, have relatively indolent disease that are being followed by active surveillance. And I have a couple of other patients um, who have more aggressive disease who need systemic therapy now. Um, so in my own anecdotal experience, I don't think that I can say we certainly just need more time. You know, if the frequency is 2% in PTC, is it a little bit higher in poorly differentiated thyroid cancer? I think we don't really quite know the answer to those questions yet and it's hard to figure it's hard to answer those questions when the frequency is as low as it is but I don't consider this a zebra that isn't in, that's insignificant here because again if we genotype um, all of the patients who have advanced systemic progressive disease we're going to find actionable mutations in a majority of those patients and they're not all going to be BRAF uh, uh, mutations and we want to be able to treat all of the patients who are presenting uh, with actionable mutations I think. Um, so uh, this patient is now being enrolled in the Star Trek II trial um, that I talked about yesterday. This uh, trial is a, a global phase two basket trial investigating entrectinib, uh, which uh, inhibits is a multi-kinase inhibitor that inhibits uh, TRAC, A, B, and C as well. Um, and as I mentioned yesterday in the phase one experience, there were 119 patients that were enrolled, and there was an overall response rate of 79%. Um, in addition, the reason why I chose this particular trial rather than another trial that's also available is that there are responses um, that have been seen in the CNS in three or four patients who had primary CNS tumors as well as uh, uh, patients with metastases. So for audience members who may not attend the oncology meetings, so at American Society of Clinical Oncology, one of the more provocative reports that many people were talking about was this high response rate in a tumor agnostic uh, targeting of the TREC fusions. And so this really encouraged people to think that this is a, a viable target and this is something that you'll hear about more. It's a lower frequency alteration, but something that you'll, you'll see more in the literature as time goes on. And it, it seems to work in bone mets, at least in our N of um, three that we've put on the trial of papillary thyroid cancer. Patients, um, we initially thought it was just in young patients, but they've shown it in, in older patients, it does exist as well. And um, our three patients who have had NTREC fusions um, have, have gone on this trial and have gone from a performance status that was poor and unable to work to doing, you know, to being, and uh, to be able to work. And two of them are sustained for over um, nine months, so very important to, it, we can't underscore genotyping, finding these rare ones who will respond to therapies and thinking outside of your FDA approved therapies. So I want to bring us back a little bit. All of these three cases we've talked about so far are unusual cases, and yet you can get a sense of the thought process behind the experts dealing with these cases. And in fact, in the final analysis, every patient is unique. So every patient is unusual in different respects. But we'll try and get maybe to a, a more usual, unusual patient. So um, we'll try and do another differentiated case and get to another medullary. I have omitted anaplastics because I think these have been covered in a panel yesterday. Uh, pretty well. So this particular gentleman was in his 50s, um, a physician who um, presented with papillary carcinoma, um, tall cell variant. Um, he was found in 2007, however, to have subclinical hypothyroidism, was put on replacement. But then 
Uh, five years later, developed chronic cough. Dyspnea led to evaluation in the ED, and he was found to have the imaging that you see here, which includes a, a primary right lobe tumor, which um, was the CT core biopsy was thought to be consistent with papillary thyroid cancer, and then you see lung metastases at, uh, at presentation. So um, um, NIFA, in comparison to the patient we saw who was abused with radioactive iodine, is what's the prognosis of this patient? So, I mean, I have a couple of comments before we talk about the prognosis. Um, you know, looking at that CT scan, yes, this patient ha does have distant METs, uh, well, has a high-risk variant, tall cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, um, and does have lung metastases at, well, that's not really, pr is it presentation? Yeah, this is presentation. Um, but typically when we have patients with lung metastases, even with fairly large volume, larger than what we're seeing here, they don't tend to be short of breath. So I would want, you know, evaluation of the trachea and the vocal cords and make sure there isn't something else going on um, or a secondary lung process if they're having shortness of breath. But especially the cough alerts you to something potentially in the upper airway. So I may get, just depending on the history, um, I'd, I may get pulmonary involved. But overall, um, you know, the prognosis is difficult to tell with a one shot, um, like a one snapshot in this patient's time, but you can tell them that they're at high, that they're at high risk for um, requiring, for uh, progressing thyroid cancer and advancing disease and requiring systemic therapy, but it's not something that we necessarily start now, definitely not in a one snapshot. So um, there are more information, so we excluded pulmonary emboli, so that was critical because we had similar um, consideration. Um, patient was there after treated with near total thyroidectomy, 3.9 centimeters. Two of three was the outside grading, again, tall cell variant. Um, we can talk about that. A couple nodes involve vascular invasion, but we know it's distantly metastatic. And then I provided some, um, this is 600E, not 500E yeah, in the say. BRAF. Um, <laughs> and TURT promoter, which are pretty typical for, for papillary. And uh, the patient was thereafter treated with radioactive iodine, and post-therapy scan really did not show very much uptake. And I show you a somewhat uh, enhanced view of the CT scan of the chest to kind of give you a sense of the, the extensive micrometastatic disease, which probably was a contributor to his, to his dyspnea. This is, again, February 15. So um, given metastatic disease, extent of disease, uh, de novo radioactive iodine insensitivity, um, thoughts on this further? Sophie, what would you be doing in France? Given that, what we would be doing, I would do an FDG PET. Um, okay. uh, especially for evaluation of uh, bone lesions and see how much uh, SUVR. Uh, what is his prognosis? His prognosis is not really good, um, meaning that he won't be cured of his disease and then he's going to need uh, systemic treatment in your nearby future. We don't have any data on the resist criteria in this patient, but he's symptomatic. So what do you think about these data from Memorial that show that in patients who present with distant metastatic disease, their median survival is about five years? Is this accurate in your viewpoint? And, you know, do we disclose this to the patients? You know, what, what are your thoughts? Do you believe this, these data? No, I, I do believe in their data, but I think that this patient had a survival uh, under five years yeah. uh, because of the pathology. I mean, this is tall cell. Uh, he's quite old. He's over the age of 50. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's got a survival of five years. Yeah. So, Matt, comments? Yeah, the thing with this patient that, that you have to, um, that, you know, for the audience to recognize, and I can't remember the actual size of those lung metastases, but they may not qualify for, quote, clinical trial because they may not meet 
resist criteria if everything is less than a centimeter, but this patient looks like they've got lymphangitic spread of their tumor throughout their lungs, and that's why they're symptomatic. And so this is why adhering strictly to resist criteria just is not clinically the right way to go all the time. And, and, and I would agree that with no therapy, you know, the shorter prognosis would be typical, but this patient does have a, an actionable mutation uh, based on that screening, and, and we have seen some fairly dramatic responses to, to, to that. So while I, I would certainly tell them their prognosis, I would certainly image their brain as we talked about as well in this circumstance. Um, and, and, you know, the pet, especially to look at the bones, I think would be really important. Um, you know, I, I would tell them also that there is variability in response and they're in that, you know, group of tumors where it is actually hard to predict. Some behave a little bit more like anaplastic cancer and just don't respond to anything and, 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 others, and others don't. I'd like to know what the thyroglobulin is to see if it's got some evidence of differentiation yeah. other than a little bit of radioiodine uptake. Uh, and some of those issues as well. But I would not wait for re necessarily for resist progression in a patient like this who's symptomatic with lymphangitic lung spread. I think that that's a, this is a little bit of a different category than some of the others, at least in my practice. Well, when Lori and NIFA are nodding, I think we've all seen patients like this. We can enroll on a clinical trial potentially because they're below resist criteria, but we know they need treatment. And, you know, it's, uh, now it's, it's really... Uh, Good to have some approved drugs. Now the BRAF V600E mutation. Um, there are a couple questions. So, um, Lori, can you tell us about V600E BRAF mutation versus other BRAF mutations? Is there a difference? Do they all respond to BRAF inhibitors? What What are your Lori smiling at so, me? So yeah. So so you know for the TCGA. Uh, data show that there are other, uh, we do encounter other BRAF mutations apart from V600E as well as BRAF fusions. And if you look at their gene expression profiling, they have more of a RAS-like uh, phenotype rather than a BRAF-like phenotype. Does that mean that those tumors won't respond to BRAF-targeted therapy? We don't know the answer to that question yet. Sure. I don't so. think that those patients have been treated. Um, there is an NCCN-sponsored multicentered <coughs> trial looking at dibrafenib alone compared to dibrafenib and trametinib that I talked about yesterday. Manisha Shah um, at Matt's Place is the, the PI of that trial. Um, and I think there were one or two patients, um, you may know the data, um, uh, that had BRAF alterations that were not V600E. And I just don't know yet uh, how those one or two patients did specifically to the therapy. Um, but both the single agent and the combination showed a response rate of about 50%, 54%. Um, so that is a treatment option, um, though I don't know that, um, you know, I don't, we don't know what the right sequence is should they receive a, drug, a VEGFR TKI like lenvatinib first and reserve uh, the BRAF-directed therapy um, as a second line. Um, uh, dibrafenib and trametinib are not FDA approved for the treatment of thyroid cancer. Um, we, we happen to be able to have pretty good luck getting access to the drugs, particularly if there isn't another therapy or they have progressed on a TKI, on another TKI. So here's what happened, and um, logistically there are a couple issues here. One is, uh, you know, we really would benefit from randomized data of VEGFR versus BRAF but the absolute response rates are lower to BRAF inhibitors in the 30-40% versus pazopinib, lenvatinib, 50 to 65% range. Um, the other extenuating circumstance here is because of the patient's net worth and his being a physician, he could not get off-label approval to um, get patient assistance program. So the cost of dibrafenib would have been over 100K a year out of pocket and we could get these other drugs. So he was first treated with pazopinib and this is where uh, things take some interesting turns. So really nice response. But what happened is this patient developed some eye visual problems and uh, we, Matt and I had talked about this earlier today. I tend to be aware of the potential for choroidal, for retinal metastasis. 
Our, uh, we have very good eye folks who are very good at identifying these with ultrasound in this case. And they're probably more common than we think. Uh, I, almost every time I think of them, I, I see them 50% or, or more. And um, the, uh, this led to a question of, is therapy, should therapy be changed? And so one of my colleagues felt, well, you know, this is disease progression, maybe we should change therapy. So what happened was the patient was changed from pazopinib to lenvatinib. And what you see is that there was a response to lenvatinib, but was relatively short-lived. And then what I show here is a plot of the different treatments the patient received over time versus therapy. And what we're looking at is uh, amylase and lipase. And the patient developed a abdominal pain rating through the back, went to the emergency room, was found to have acute pancreatitis, um, was treated for this, and this occurred on lenvatinib therapy as it turned out. So do we see, how often do we see pancreatitis? Do you, you know, in, in Rochester, I'm conscious of this, and I always get lipase and amylase, at least early on. Does everybody do that? Do we not do that? You know, what's your, Naifa, you're smiling. Do you, do you see this? Do you worry about it? So, I mean, we always worry about everything, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we were seeing a lot of chemical pancreatitis. So we used to measure amylase and lipase in everyone like they did in the clinical trials originally. And we were seeing a lot of um, rise in amylase or rise in lipase or both. And we would refer to GI and say, what's going on? The patient's asymptomatic. You know, you, uh, you do a... Uh, you, Clin proper clinical exam and symptoms, and they don't have any symptoms. You, uh, in the beginning, we were adding CT abdomens, and there was no evidence of any pancreatitis, sending them to GI. And so they were saying, just continue your drug. This is a chemical pancreatitis. We're seeing it more and more. So we've actually stopped just routinely measuring it, but definitely if a patient has symptoms, we're taking it seriously, holding drug and measuring not just amylase lipase, but looking for... Um, What's the hole in the abdomen called? So we, we see viscous. the same. This patient <laughs> was viscous. pretty clearly <laughs> symptomatic. So that kind of changed things a little bit. And so then the, the next uh, peculiar thing, you're seeing a lot of peculiar things today, is that we pose the question, since we tr were able to treat focally the choroidal disease, we flip back to pazopinib, and the patient has gotten a second response, okay. interestingly and is not having problems with the pancreatitis now. Matt wants to comment. So in retrospect, I was gonna ask this at the time, uh, why did you conclude that it was progression on pazopinib? Did you have a baseline yeah. choroidal image before? Because I, I may have been a little yeah. hesitant to take him off with that kind of a dramatic or lung response yet symptoms? first. Yeah, so the patient had eye symptoms. There was no baseline imaging. This was one of my colleagues, this wasn't. So I, as most of us know, you know, focal progression, I probably would have continued treatment and treated focally. It's a but, mixed response sort of thing. Yeah, and in between here, the patient received exidinib, which he didn't respond. He progressed in less than two months. Um, so you see how aggressive the disease is, how responsive it can be, how peculiar it can be. It can metastasize to sites you don't think about. The choroid is, you know, the uh, eye, folks um, tell me that this is the most vascular normal structure in the body. Mm. So metastases are probably missed pretty frequently. Um, so this is just kind of a peculiar variant that maybe we should be uh, sensitive to. And then there's this question of re-challenge. So Sophie, this is a lead-in to your study in, in France maybe where you're comparing continuous versus interrupted pazopinib. What, can you tell us anything about that? I think it's probably not been released yet. No, I think that it's a little bit different from, from what is presented here in this case. In this case, there was a dramatic response uh, in the lung and just one lesion appearing, which is what we call dissociated response. And we see this more and more. Um, mostly it's going to be one brain lesion coming out or one bone lesion, one choroidal uh, metastasis. And in these cases, when patients were on trial, they had to go out of the trial. In clinical practice, I think that it's really important to, to keep in mind that if the other lesions have decreased in size and are really well controlled, 
uh, we can associate local treatments to systemic treatments, even though we have resist progression. Um, the trial you are talking on uh, in France we have is a trial on pazopanib and sequential pazopanib. So patients have treatment for six months with pazopanib, and in case of stable disease or uh, treatment response, they are randomized either uh, to stay on pazopanib or to stop pazopanib until disease progression and then re-challenge the drug and start pazopanib again. Um, the, when will you have data? Um, there is uh, 15 more patients to be enrolled, so data should be available and in about a year. So this is interrogating this question of can we lessen side effects and collateral damage and perhaps uh, acquired resistance by using intermittent dosing. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll eventually have some results there, at least in the case of pizopanib, um, so that we're looking forward anxiously to those data. So let's move on to a medullary case, and um, I'm hoping that this will kind of give us some general principles also. So this particular um, patient was a gentleman of 55 years uh, old. I'm sorry, you know, Keith, can, can yes. uh, Matt was whispering to me, and I had the same, Please. I was having the same thought. So just w one other nuance about your case that's interesting is this differential response to the VEGFR multikinase inhibitors. Yes. Um, you know, we sort of think of them as, as uh, cousins of each other, but, but there are, there's differential activity. I, I was hoping you wouldn't ask yeah. me to explain why. <laughs> no, Matt's asking. Well, I was that. asking yeah. whether the, whether you look for things like PDGFR mutations or overexpression yeah. or whether you did anything like that. That because yeah. exitinib is a little more pure anti-VEGF, yeah. right? And so. So there was no FGFR or PDGFR. We know that, like uh, lenvatinib and pizopatinib target those, and uh, we've seen like we've shown in cholangiocarcinoma, the pizopanib is therapeutically relevant for exactly this reason of, F of FGFR. So this is an important, but in this case, we couldn't identify a known differentially targeted kinase. But it's a very good question. It tells you how little we know, and you know, the anaplastic trial that's accrued turned out to be on the basis of a previously unsuspected targeted kinase, Aurora A. Mm -hmm. So there are probably a lot of kinases we don't even know that are targeted by these drugs differentially. Mm -hmm. So it's, these are very important questions. But it also brings up that if patients respond to one inhibitor, they may respond to another one, and they're not all equal. And so, you know, in the early days, I figured if you progress through one, it was useless to try another one, but it turns out not at all to be the case. So be persistent and try other kinase inhibitors. Now, we're still working on the uh, BRAF inhibitor for this patient, so you know that's, that's mm -hmm. next. So we'll just kind of keep that on the, uh, the radar. So now back to our 55-year-old medullary patient who presented in 2010 with diarrhea, um, self-treated with Imodium, and then uh, noted two years later a neck mass. So again, not incidentally detected, but symptomatic in a couple ways. And then was treated with a subtotal thyroidectomy uh, in mid-2012, medullary thyroid cancer, 7.4 centimeters, 14 of 70 nodes involved. And um, there was a soft tissue mass also excised, which was up to 5.4 centimeters, and this was also medullary, so it was a met in the neck. And um, in not very much time, you see this was a change in institutions, but from May to August, there was a secondary debulking because of presumably a persistent disease of the neck. But by two years later, the patient had developed liver metastases, had a number of ablations. We tried to palliate uh, focally and the question that comes up as to what's next, and most people on the panel have said, well, of course, we need to know what's going on with the alterations in here, and this is where there's kind of a ringer in this case. So, NIFO, what's the, what are the most common alterations we would see in medullary? What, what do you see in your experience? Um, so the vast majority of um, medullary thyroid cancers, or, or at least half of them, somatic, meet, uh, assuming that this is sporadic. Or sporadic, MTC, yes. Um, uh, oh, you did say that, sorry. Um, then half of them would have a RET uh, mutation, and majority of those are RET 918 um, somatic mutations. And then um, you have some RAS mutations, 
um, that occur. Um, and then there's some, um, uh, some other mutations that can occur that are uh, random, like randomly you'll see a BRAF, which is not typical for MTC. Um, and so he has an HRAS mutation um, uh, in his medullary thyroid cancer, which potentially could drive um, systemic therapy if he needed it. I need more information to determine if he needs systemic therapy, such as his calcitonins and his cross-sectional imaging and progression over time. So not being an endocrinologist, you know I omit things like CA and calcitonin sometimes, so apologies <laughs> for that because I'm looking at anatomy sometimes. So calcitonin CAs were rising and um, we talked about, you know, the the ratio, the CA was relatively higher than we'd often see in better behaved disease relative to the calcitonin. Um, liver mets were evolving and we're talking about how this HRAS alteration affects your thinking. So traditionally, you know, vandetinib and cabozantinib have been approved uh, presumptively on the basis of the RET targeting, but uh, Sophie, um, I'm asking a dangerous question here. Do you think it's the RET targeting that's mostly important, partially important? Is it VEGFR? What are your, what's your take? Is it worthwhile trying a you know, vandetinib or cabo in a patient like this, even though they don't have a RET alteration? Yeah, I think it, it is worthwhile uh, trying it, but the answer to your question uh, uh, might be available once uh, we have results of the trials with uh, anti-RET drugs. Um, uh, because effectively, um, we do have effect with vandetinib and cabozantinib, even especially on the PFS. On the overall survival, things are more difficult to evaluate, but um, so we, need, we, we need to test anti -red, pure anti red drugs to answer your question. And fortunately, we have those on the horizon. So we're expecting within the next year, there'll probably be trials um, where we'll start to maybe get some answers on the more selective red inhibitor uh, outcomes in medullary, but maybe not so relevant to this patient. So the question is, um, you know, what about options? And here's a list of a bunch. And we contemplated options. And in this case, because there was a time-limited clinical trial, which was a good thing that we at least avail the patient to this because the thyroid segment, I think, has since closed to accrual. Mm -hmm. This is a run through uh, Memorial, and it's using Tipifarnib as a way to try and target these HRAS altered tumors. We treated the patient with this approach, and what you saw is that it was kind of a, a slow uh, burn in terms of the resist progression. And then the patient called me and basically was biting his tongue, and we saw this skull base metastasis on after a vandetinib treatment, so it did not respond to vandetinib. He had radiotherapy, and now the patient's on Cabo following Sophie's um, thought that it's worthwhile to consider another kinase inhibitor. And um, so, um, Lori, I'm, I'm picking you, hoping that I'm increasing the probability of the desired answer here, so we'll see what happens. So what if we exhaust all the kinase inhibitors? Are there old school things we could we could bring out in this patient to try who has this HRS mutated tumor. What what else could we try if we uh, if we need it for further disease progression? Are you trying to get me to say the dreaded word cytotoxic chemotherapy? <laughs> so so um, tell us about cytotoxic chemotherapy in medullary. Well, so so yeah, so I, I don't have all of the studies uh, at the tip of my tongue, so I apologize for that. Um, but there are, there are a number of studies that have shown response rates to various cytotoxic chemotherapy regimens. Um, I know that Memorial, for example, um, 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 will turn to cytotoxic chemotherapy perhaps a little bit earlier than I do in advanced progressive MTC, um, and they favor a regimen with DTIC. Um, and uh, so I have anecdotal experience with that regimen as well, um, but not much more than that. Um, you know, I do think that thinking of other uh, TKIs is, is a reasonable thing for this patient as well. I would, oh, so you did mention radiotherapy to the skull-based tumor. I think that that makes all the sense in the world to have done. 
Um, you know, with the um, with cabazatinib, with vendetinib, um, there were patients on those trials who did not have RET mutations who responded. Um, however, w with the cabazatinib trial, at least the patients with the M918T mutation did have better clinical benefit, and there's actually an overall survival benefit in, in that patient population. There you go. So, um, so I think that those drugs probably uh, do have uh, RET specific uh, ben targeted benefits for MTC patients, and then also other maybe VEGFR mediated activity. Um, there is a trial, so I think um, I would generally turn to uh, the other FDA approved drug as second line systemic therapy for the patient and, and try vendetinib. Um, yeah, and I would also had think about. Vendetinib already. Um, so progress on vendetinib. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was not. That was the okay. skull base. I, I kind okay, of I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, so, and then I would also think about clinical trial options for MEC uh, uh, inhibition. If there's a clinical trial uh, in the phase one program with MEC, perhaps in combination with something else. There are now drugs with MEK inhibitors and, and, uh, and immunotherapy combinations um, that might be of interest. So Matt? So if you go back to the profile that you showed genetically, just to make this point to everyone, uh, this patient also has an ATR kinase mutation yes. according to that list. Yes. And, and ATR is a DNA damage repair uh, pathway. And this is becoming a common theme uh, in very aggressive forms of thyroid cancer, anaplastic, poorly differentiated, distant metastases as well. Uh, this is an, another actionable kinase with drugs in clinical trial. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little different than what we typically think about in endocrinology, where we're thinking about kinase inhibitors and MEK pathway inhibitors. Um, but, but this is known in other tumors and being studied, and, and I think there is probably uh, something worth considering in a patient like this where you're running out of options. Uh, Espe especially as well. because of the mutational, and, and also the, with the mutational load that you might expect with right. an ATR. With an ATR, uh, and uh, also the fact that it might cause radio resistance if you're thinking about radiation therapy. So I think it's, I would take a step back and look at that. Yeah. And maybe something to think about. And the yeah, and the other thing was also um, potentially to either biopsy the area of progression and also think about cell-free DNA. Um, I think it's something that's being used more and more to find resistance mutations. I've done this in a couple of my MTC because we all have this problem. We've finished Vandy. We've finished Cabo. You know, what do we do next? And um, the cell-free DNA panels, um, Gardent or any other one, can sometimes identify that resistance mutation that may lead to um, one of the clinical trials or, or newer treatments that are out there. Um, so, you know, and I think in addition, if in a patient, not this patient, but in a patient who had uh, somatic RET 918 on their tumor, thinking about when to initially start uh, therapy in those who have distant metastatic disease, if they're releasing that uh, RET918 in their cell-free DNA, there was a paper that Dr. Cody wrote that showed that there was, that those who have a high level of cell-free DNA of RET918 can predict those who need um, therapy. So I just think we need to think about uh, um, other things in addition, because we are at a loss. What do we do in those patients post Vandy and Cabo? Sophie? Well, the, the we, in those patients, we, we would go on the third line treatment uh, with uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, with um, a 5-FU and, and the DISN because there's, the response rate is about 20 percent. Uh, it's really well tolerated, so this is uh, what, what we do. Yeah, so I, I agree with everything that's been said here. We tend to use a lot of decarbazine-based, you know, temozolomide has been used in this context too. Um, my preference, because I use it a lot in a different tumor, few and para, I often use CVD, cyclophosphamide, vincristin, to carbazine as a starting point and drop out the vincristin um, because of neuropathy. But there are options that are old school in addition to the more targeted alterations that we've talked about here. So it's important not to completely lose sight of these other approaches that may be relevant that we otherwise uh, may not think about because of a new era in targeted therapies. So we have two minutes left, and I have an infinite number of cases. I always have an infinite <laughs> number of cases. But let's maybe pause for a minute and see if there might be any questions from the audience about this general arena. And what I've tried to do is re-
you know, assemble cases that really were non-overlapping with some of the cases that were otherwise presented in other forums. Um, so are there any, any questions from the audience? Greg has a question. So I will paraphrase. So Lori, this calls for speculation on the part of the witness, as they say in the court of law. So um, do you, what's your guess? Do you think this is, uh, you know, an acquired mutation that occurred on an island, uh, Madagascar, to create those peculiar creatures? Or do you think this was a subclonal, you know, uh, variant that was there from the start, but just manifest late. Why did this patient have brain mets and most patients not in a similar long disease trajectory? Yeah, so, so Greg, of course, uh, asks an unanswerable question. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, the, uh, no, so, I mean, we sort of learn in your first year of oncology fellowship that the <coughs> that really the distant metastatic disease comes from the primary tumor. Um, so when patients uh, uh, worry about distant metastatic disease, um, um, you know, we try to explain, it, with a nodal recurrence in the neck, we try to explain that that doesn't really uh, necessarily impact on that. We don't really know the answer to that question. Um, there, there, you know, are tumor models that, uh, that suggest that that isn't, uh, the only phenomenon in terms of, uh, of hematogenous metastasis. And, you know, if you think about it, it probably makes sense that tumor cells can get into the bloodstream from other sites of disease as well, um, particularly supervascularized sites like the liver. You know, you, you may not have as much metastatic potential from nodes as you might from bone metastasis, liver metastasis, et cetera. Um, so, but you know, I think that, so I'm not going to answer that question for you, um, but you know, one of the, the case for me is, is um, you know, is a cautionary tale um, that um, thyroid cancer is not a good cancer, and it never is, um, and that even when we think it's a good cancer, uh, we do have to um, uh, be on the lookout uh, because it's, it can be a cancer that, that un has a very long natural history and can unfold over a patient's lifetime. So I'm indebted to my colleagues, Nifa, Lori, Matt, and Sophie for being tortured by such convoluted cases <laughs> and being good sports as well as experts in informing the discussion today. I hope you'll join me in thanking the panel. Thanks very much. <laughs>